Hi everyone, I'm so excited for today's message. We're gonna be exploring an issue that is of vital importance. It's of vital importance to you and your growth as a disciple of Jesus. And it's gonna be of vital importance to the future of St. Peter's Church. Before I tell you what I'm speaking about today, I want to address anyone watching this talk who perhaps doesn't yet consider themselves a follower of Jesus or isn't yet a member of St. Peter's Church family. If that's you, um, I want to say uh, you're so welcome. I'm thrilled that you're engaging with St. Peter's Church online. But I want to say that today you are off the hook so you can sit back and relax. This message isn't said and preached with you in mind. You see, today I want to talk about money and in particular, generous giving. So I've called my message for today, everything you never wanted to ask about giving. And I wanna warn you guys, my goal is to be clear and direct as I try and teach what the Bible would say to us about generous giving with our finances. Now, like many of us, I'm probably naturally slightly uncomfortable when it comes to speaking about money in public. And I remember a pastor friend of mine who I uh, really look up to. He's kind of a mentor to me. I remember a couple of years ago when I was preparing a message on giving for my um, previous church, I remember asking him, what on earth do I do? How do I say this? I don't want to offend anyone. Don't want to upset anyone. Don't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable. And he, he's an Aussie and Aussies generally can be quite direct people. And uh, my friend, Pastor Anthony, he said to me, you give it to them straight, clear and direct. Don't water it down. Say it with love and then let people do with it what they want. And that's kind of what I'm going to try and do today. I want to kind of put it all out there. I want to give it to you clear and direct and you are free to do with my message what you wish and frankly it's between you and the Lord when it comes to your giving. So my agenda for today um, and my heart behind this talk, and I want you to know this because I think, you know, if it gets a bit challenging, I want you to know my heart. My heart is for you and your family to flourish and thrive in every sphere of life, including financially. And my heart is for St. Peter's Church to be positioned to step in to all that God has for us here at St. Peter's in the coming years. And we're not going to be able to do that unless as a church we learn to give generously and sacrificially. Now, pastoral preamble. I'm well aware that this is perhaps a harder time than ever, certainly in my lifetime, to talk about finances, money, and try to inspire a church to give generously and sacrificially. So I want to say to you today, if you are broke, if you're in debt, if finances are a genuine source of anxiety and concern for you, I don't want anything that I say to increase the burden that you're already carrying in your life. And actually what I'd say to you, if you're watching this, you're part of St. Peter's Church family, or even if you're not, and you are really concerned by your finances, then I encourage you to, um, to reach out if you want help, Maybe share with your life group leader that finances are a big concern for you or even speak to me. And we as a church in this season would want to do all that we can to support you and stand with you. So if you're in that position, I don't want anything I'm going to say today to burden you. Now, that being said, before I start talking about what the Bible says about giving, I want to just ground us in what I'd call three core biblical truths that will help us to think biblically and Christianly uh, when it comes to money, wealth and possessions. So three core biblical truths. Firstly, everything belongs to God. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. 
Emily, my three-year-old daughter, she's at a stage in her life where anything she lays her eyes on or picks up in her hand, she claims possession of. So she'll pick things up that belong to me or to Alison and she'll say, uh, Daddy, mine. Or she'll jump into our bed and she'll lie on our bed and she'll say to me when I come in the room, Daddy, get out of this room. This is my bed. This is my room. It's charming, isn't it? Um, she's at a stage where she doesn't recognise that what she has and what we as her parents provide her with doesn't actually belong to her. She doesn't own everything that she has. And I think perhaps sometimes we're like that, aren't we? We think that everything that we own belongs to us and we fail to recognise that actually in reality the whole earth and everything in it belongs to God and God in his graciousness and generosity allows us to look after, enjoy and steward some of his good creation and the good things of creation. Okay, which leads us on to second core truth. Humanity is created to steward. So if you wanna know what the kind of, the job description of your life is as a human being, it's to steward. Genesis 1, 28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. These are the words that God um, speaks to and over Adam and Eve in the garden. Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Human beings were created under God to steward creation. So everything belongs to God, but God chose to invite humanity into the task of stewarding creation. And so everything that we have, we're called to steward to the glory of God. Our money and our possession, our time and our talents, we're called to steward under God. Okay, third core biblical truth. God is generous. God's generous. So we've sung already today uh, one of my personal favourite songs at the moment. Um, good, good father. We proclaimed as we worship together that God is a good, good father. And it's so important that we actually believe that. That God is a good and kind and loving and generous father who loves us as a parent loves their children. The whole gospel is a story of God's generosity. It's the story of a God of love who pursues relationships with sinful and rebellious humanity. And he so loves and so longs to be in relationship with broken human beings like me and you, that he gives the best that he can give himself in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, in order to restore relationship with me and you. It's impossible for us as we think about giving to out give God. Because God has first given himself in the person of Jesus. Christ who goes to the cross and rises again three days later is the ultimate display of the generosity of God. So with those three core truths in mind, I want to now introduce our Bible reading before we continue to explore this theme of generous giving. The reading is taken from Malachi 3 verses 6 to 10. I the Lord do not change, so you descendants of Jacob have not been destroyed. Since the time of your ancestors you have disobeyed my rules and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord all-powerful. But you ask, how can we return? Should a person rob God? But you are robbed of robbing me. You ask, how have we robbed you? You have robbed me in your offerings and the tenth of the crops. So a curse is on you because the whole nation has robbed me. Bring to the storehouse a full tenth of what you earn, so there will be food in my house. Trust me in this, says the Lord all powerful. I will open the windows of heaven for you and pour out all the blessings you need. This is the word of the Lord. 
So, everything you never wanted to ask about giving. Four questions. Who should I give? Why should I give? How much should I give? And what should I give to? First question, who should give? Short answer, you, if you're a follower of Jesus and you consider yourself a member of St. Peter's Church, then I believe the Bible would say to each one of us that we're called to give generously to support the mission and ministry of St. Peter's Church. Now, giving is always a challenge at any age or stage. You may be watching this today and you're broke and you're in real financial hardship. Do you remember the story perhaps in the Gospels when Jesus uh, sees a uh, woman put the last coin that she has to her name in the offering basket and Jesus commends her faith. He says, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the offering than all the others. Others gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything, all she had to live, it, live on. Or perhaps you're watching this, and uh, God bless you if you are, you're rich and you're swimming in cash, you're sleeping on a mattress made of 50 pound notes. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew 19, verse 24. It, Jesus says, it's easier for a camel to enter the eye of the needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So whatever your financial situation, giving is a challenge and it's giving's a d difficult at any stage of life you may be watching this and you're a teenager and you're thinking not relevant to me i'm not earning yet i only get 40 quid every now and then to buy a playstation 4 game so don't need to worry about giving yet you may be a 20 something and you're thinking that you're not financially secure yet so one day when you've got enough money and enough savings and you've built your family and you've got your dream house, then you'll start giving. Absolute nonsense. And in fact, if I can challenge any group of people today in particular, it would be our young adults, our 20-somethings, perhaps even our 30-somethings, who even though I don't know who gives what in the church, what I do know is that we have very few of our young adults who are regularly giving. Okay. 30 some things you don't think it's uh, possible to give generously because you're busy raising your kids and as i'm finding out the hard way children are a bottomless pit of money 40 some things you might think you're not ready to start giving generously because you're busy climbing the property ladder and you've got to save for the bigger house as your children are growing up 50 some things grandkids are coming and as my parents are discovering the hard way, grandkids are very expensive to look after. 60 some things, you don't wanna start giving generously and it's difficult for you because you're preparing for retirement. You're winding down your careers and you need to make sure that you're comfortable into the rest of your life. And perhaps 70 some things plus, you've never tied. And if you've not tied and you're 80, it's probably too late to start now. Well, I want to encourage us wherever we're at in our life, whatever age or stage of life we're at, giving is something that's relevant and important for us if we're followers of Jesus. Here's the thing, times are tough, and I'm really aware of that, so I don't want to sound too harsh or judgmental here. Times are tough, but as the church, I believe that we're called to be a loving family, and we're all in this together. So if you're really struggling at the moment, I want you to feel free to be honest and vulnerable and let the church help you. And if you're comfortable and you are wealthy in this season, then I think perhaps it's time for you to step up and give perhaps more generously than you ever have before. By the way, I'm aware I may offend some people in this talk. Okay, question two. Why should I give generously? Okay, let me take a moment to unashamedly appeal to your own self-interest. I'm well aware that you probably didn't roll out of bed this morning and think, I do hope Danny challenges us all to give more money. Okay, so here are four reasons followers of Jesus will want to give generously. Reason one, generous givers enable mission and ministry. Nothing here happens at St. Peter's without your generous financial giving 
and voluntary service. They're probably the two foundations of everything that will happen in any local church. Some people live under the illusion that perhaps because a church like St. Peter's is the Church of England, that the Church of England, some central uh, pot of money, helps us cover all our costs. And so money's never really a problem for a church like St. Peter's. That's absolute rubbish. If anything, we almost pay a subscription fee, what's called parish share, to, um, to help to uh, support the ministry of the wider Church of England. Generous, generous giving, it enables the ministry and the mission that God is calling St. Peter's to step into in the coming years. And I'm so excited about the progress that the uh, vision discernment group's been making. And I'm really pleased to say very soon we'll be able to share with you uh, the vision of this church for the next five years. But until then, let me just say, God has big plans for this church, but we're not going to be able to step into and experience and do all that God has for us unless as a church we step up and grow in our ability and desire to give generously and sacrificially. Okay, reason two, generous givers please God. So if pleasing God's of any interest to you, then generosity and giving will be a real priority for you. There's a past, present and future dynamic to why giving generously pleases God. So firstly, generous giving is an expression of gratitude for what God has done for us yesterday. So we give generously as a response, as an expression of gratitude and thankfulness for all that God has done for us through Christ on the cross, through his sending his spirit, through the prayers that we've had answered in our lives, for the miracles that we've seen, for the breakthroughs that we've experienced, for all the good blessings that God has given us. Uh, throughout lockdown on, in the online services, 19 Reasons Why has been one of my favourite parts of what we do. And I thought pretty early on in lockdown, we're going to need to be a people that learns to be thankful and grateful for all that God has given us, even in difficult times. Okay, secondly, generous giving is an expression of worship. Generous sacrificial giving says, I want to worship God today. And if you look at scripture, especially in the Old Testament, one of my favorite books, Leviticus, for example, as you catch a vision of what worship looks like, sacrifice is an essential component of worship. In Leviticus, the first chapters, I recommend reading Leviticus if you haven't already. Um, we have the burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, all these different kinds of offerings and sacrifices that were an essential part of the worshipping life of the people of God, Israel. Worship always involves sacrifice. Okay, thirdly, generous giving is an expression of faith. Generous giving says, I trust God for my tomorrow. Listen to these words from Malachi 3 verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So God says through the prophet of Malachi, and just to put this verse into context, the, the people had been kind of withholding their, their giving, their tithe to God, and this is God's response. God says, give what you are supposed to give, and I will pour out my blessing upon you. Test me in this. This, to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, to my knowledge, this is the only occurrence, time in the Bible when God invites us to put him to the test. Putting God to the test is generally seen as a bit of no-no. The only time God ever um, does that and invites us to test him is in the area of generous giving. He says, give to me, be faithful and obedient in your giving and your tithing, and I will pour out my blessing on you, and you can test me on that. So if you've never given, why don't you test God? Why don't you do what the Bible invites you to do? And that is to begin giving generously and sacrificially and see what God does in your life.
Okay, reason three. Generous givers are trusted with more. Luke 16, verse 10. Jesus concludes the parable of the tenants with this kingdom principle. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? This is a key kingdom principle. God will often give you a little to see and to test you so that he can then give you more and increase what he's already given you. What will happen is God will uh, lead someone to himself, will give them small bits of responsibility and opportunities to prove themselves and their faithfulness and their trustworthiness. And then over time, season after season, he will increase his trust in that person. And that's how it works, I think, in in responsibility and also with finances. That God wants to know he can trust us with a little before he can trust us with much. So if you're not being obedient and faithful in your giving, then why on earth would God trust you by blessing you with more and with increase? Okay, reason number four. Uh, Generous givers experience joy. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This is normally the go-to verse when talking about giving in the New Testament. In this verse, the word cheerful literally means hilarious. It's from the same root Greek word. Imagine being a hilarious giver. Someone who finds such joy and delight in giving generously and sacrificially that it's hilarious. Question three, how much should I give? And at this point, I want to introduce a key biblical principle that I really want to embed in the culture of St. Peter's. And the big principle is this, tithing. Tithing literally means one tenth. It's a principle seen throughout scripture from Genesis onwards. So let me give you a little whistle stop tour of the principle of tithing. So Genesis 14, the context, God has just given Abraham or Abraham victory in battle. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high and he blessed Abraham saying, blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth and praise be to God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything, the origins of the tithe. Genesis 28, a few chapters later, Jacob makes a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I will return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I've set up as a pillar will be my, will be God's house and all, and of all that you give me, I will give a tenth. Leviticus 27. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Deuteronomy 14. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine and olive oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. Nehemiah 13, when Nehemiah um, brings back the people of God uh, following their captivity in Babylon, one of the first things he does in Nehemiah 13 is he reinstitutes the tithe following their time in exile. And in Malachi 3, verse 6 to 12, um, you would have heard these words already. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. Okay, hopefully by now, and I could go on and on and on and on. Hopefully by now, you're getting bored and you get the idea that tithing, Giving to God one-tenth of all that you have is a fundamental biblical principle that we see throughout Scripture. Now, the keenies amongst you will have noticed that all those references are to the Old Testament. 
So I hear you ask, isn't tithing an Old Testament principle? Aren't we free from Old Testament law as Christians? Good questions. A couple of things in response. Firstly, Jesus affirms the practice of tithing. And secondly, Jesus internalizes and intensifies Old Testament law. So think about anger. Um, Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, uh, don't murder, but I say, don't be angry. Think about lust. Jesus says, you've heard that it was says, uh, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, don't even lust after another person in your heart. Now, let me illustrate this, what I want to say this way. Okay. Imagine you go to the Apple store back in the day where you could actually go to these things called shopping centers. Imagine you go to the Apple store and you ask for a basic budget phone. You've not got a lot of money to play with. And you go to the checkout and the checkout um, person says, I don't think you even do checkouts, do you, at Apple store? But, you know, you're buying this uh, from a genius or whatever. And the person who's selling it to you says, I'm very happy to give you that. It's within your budget. But out of the goodness of my own heart, why don't you also take um, a top of the range um, iPhone 11? You, d you don't just want an old basic phone, take an iPhone 11 as well. Um, and in fact, since you're here, why don't you, um, why don't you take a, um, why don't you take a kind of new top of the range iPad, since you're here? And um, why, why stop there? I'm feeling in a good mood. Um, why don't you also take a, uh, a MacBook Pro while you're at it? By now you're pretty chuffed. And then just when you think he's done, he turns to you and he says, um, I've got an iMac going, if you'd like to have that as well. Imagine how you would feel. You went in for your basic iPhone 5, if you can even get one of these these days, um, and you were offered all these other things as well. Imagine if you then turn around to that person and you said, um, actually, I don't want to pay what I was willing to pay for the iPhone 5. I'm going to give you half that much. Or I'm going to give you a tenth of that. But I still want everything that you've offered to give me. Outrageous, right? I think for many of us, that's almost what our approach can be to the idea of giving. We, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we live under the benefits of a covenant that is far superior to the old covenant that we find in the Old Testament. We have the benefits of Jesus, everything Jesus has won for us, the spirit that has been placed in our hearts. We have so many things to be thankful for, so many blessings because of what Jesus has done that people in Old Testament time didn't enjoy. So how foolish would it be for us to think that it's right or it's good or it's smart to be less generous than people who lived before Jesus. So my understanding would be that the principle of tithing, while the New Testament doesn't say much about it, the principle of tithing is assumed by Jesus and by Paul. And tithing for us as Christians, it should be our floor, not our ceiling. So tithing should be our floor, not our ceiling. And I know this is tough. I've been on my own journey of asking the Lord to help me become a more generous person. And for Alison and I, we've learned to enjoy making the decision to give away the first tenth of all that we receive to the Lord and to the church. Okay. Final question. We're getting there. Hang on. What should I give to? What should I give to? You may be particularly passionate about a charity that is all about rehabilitating penguins with injured legs. Okay, and you might be thinking, great, okay, I'm really passionate. I think it's an injustice that penguins have to live with injured legs and I want to found, I want to give to a charity that's all about helping penguins rehabilitate and recover from their injured leg. Well, I want to slightly challenge you, if, if that's you, and say I believe that as Christians and followers of Jesus, we are called to give of our finances to the church. Malachi 3 verse 10 says, bring the whole tithe 
into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. The idea of the tithe is that you bring it to the Lord and to God's house. So in the Old Testament, the tithe was used to fund the ministry of the priests and the Levites and to facilitate temple worship. So why the church? I believe that the church has a unique part to play in the purposes of God. The church is the body of Christ. There's no other organisation, institution or charity that is called to be the instrument of God in the world today in the same way that the local and global church is. So I want to encourage you as you think about your giving, how much you give and where you give to, to give first, to give your tithe, to the local church and obviously if you're watching this and you attend another church then give to that church and tell your pastor or church leader to thank me but if you're part of St Peter's I believe the teaching of the Bible would be that the tithe goes to God's house which is the local church so I'm sure I've said more than enough to challenge you and um yeah, I, I, I can imagine I've said a lot that may be quite direct. Perhaps you've not ever heard a talk like this on giving before. I assure you, we don't talk about money every week, so do come back next week. But I wanted to say uh, all that I've said. It's an important message for St. Peter's Church family people. How you respond to this message and how you choose to commit to give generously and sacrificially in the coming months and years will directly impact the kingdom impact this church will be able to have in our local community and beyond. It will directly impact how we're able to reach lost people with the hope of Jesus. So, what's the next step for you as I come into land? What's the next step for you? I don't know what your starting point is, but let me offer a few suggestions. If you give nothing, give something. If you give rarely, give regularly. If you give regularly, consider giving a whole tithe, increasing your giving. If you give a whole tithe, Perhaps God's calling you to be an extravagant giver, to go above and beyond tithing. Let me end with uh, this final thought that my Aussie pastor, Anthony friend, uh, shared with me that really stuck with me. As followers of Jesus, do we believe that a blessed 90% is worth more than an unblessed 100%? So... Why don't we take a moment to uh, respond and we're going to um, continue in worship with another song. And I want to encourage you not to run away from this talk, but to invite God to speak to you and to challenge you in the area of giving. Music.